starts right now. Masks will be mandatory, just not yet. Some clarification from City Hall about two big changes to city and county emergency orders. Face coverings will be a must for anyone 10 years or older when out in public. That doesn't include exercising outside or driving alone in your car. Now earlier the order was announced to go into effect immediately and now the city says they want to give the public a few days to obtain those masks. The public will need to start wearing masks in public by April 20th and businesses will need to provide masks to their employees by that date as well. The second change businesses who are still essential must reduce the number of people inside their facilities. They will only be allowed 25% of their occupancy limit beginning three days from today. The changes come as we see cases rise to 918 in the county tonight. That's an increase in 28 cases since yesterday. When breaking these numbers down, we see 76 people are in the hospital. That's a decrease since yesterday, and the number of deaths have stayed the same with 37. There is also a rise in recoveries. 176 have recovered from the illness. Looking down the road for when the economy reopens, also new tonight, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg and Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf announced the creation of what they're calling the COVID-19 Health Transition Team. It's a team of health experts tasked with developing a plan to move our city out of some of the restrictions we're currently in. Tiffany Huertas gives us a look at what they'll be doing. I think the idea is to look at what we know and um, and get expert opinion because we don't have a whole lot of evidence at this point, right? Dr. Junda Wu is part of the members of the new COVID-19 health transition team. The idea is what's the best way to open, to reopen while um, minimizing the risk of more infections. Yeah. The mayor says they are looking for guidance as they make decisions moving forward. How we relieve some of the social distancing or go back into it based on what protocols are, are needed, what kind of testing capacity do we need, how are we isolating folks that might turn up sick, uh, and ensuring that we're not making these decisions arbitrarily, but we're doing so to prevent another wave of infection occurring. The team hasn't held its first meeting yet, but the goal is to develop develop a health transition plan by April 27th. A lot of what we've been doing right now is simply uh, doing the crisis response, but there has been a national conversation now about, well, when do when does the economy open back up? When can businesses start running? And we know that we can't do that arbitrarily. We can't do that uh, carelessly. Tomorrow, Texas Governor Greg Abbott is expected to reveal his plan to reopen businesses in the state. Earlier this week, he said his plan will include ways to stimulate the economy and get people back to work, while also making sure to contain the spread of COVID-19. The recommendations from our medical professionals is what should guide uh, policymakers in determining how we ease out of or back into social distancing requirements. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. The city also getting on par, it seems, with the Texas Attorney General when it comes to golf courses. While municipal golf courses remain closed, new guidance allows private golf courses to open back up with some restrictions. They include no equipment rentals, caddies, or other golf personnel involved, so players would need to bring their own equipment. Social distancing must also be maintained while with people staying six feet apart. And food sales can continue as long as they follow rules for pickup or delivery. Groundskeeping may also continue. Well, one fire station confirming three firefighters with positive cases of COVID-19. Tonight, San Antonio Fire Chief Charles Hood did not name the station, but did say all firefighters assigned to the facility will be placed in 14-day quarantines to cur curtail the spread. Now, in a statement, he went on to say in part, quote, the fire station and all fire apparatuses have also been deep cleaned and disinfected as part of this effort. The quarantine of these firefighters will in no way affect our service delivery, end quote. Tracing COVID-19 in our community, Metro health officials calling it a tedious task. As cases have grown, more team members were added to identify people who may have come in contact with an infected person. As the night team Stephen Cavazos explains, Metro Health is training medical students to help with the process and keep the virus from spreading. When you have a um, community-wide transmission like this, sometimes it becomes difficult to 
pinpoint and exactly identify the source. Dr. Anita Curian, Assistant Director at San Antonio Metro Health, says on average, we see 20 to 40 cases being reported daily. And with each new case, a new investigation begins to learn who came in contact with that COVID-19 patient. It, it is extremely tedious, uh, very time intensive. It takes a village. 50 to 70 people are working on contact tracing. They include about 20 medical students who underwent a week of training. We have to have folks who are detail oriented. The process begins by reaching out to the person who came in contact with the patient and making sure they are not symptomatic. They are then asked to quarantine for two weeks. If they are symptomatic, they are recommended testing and then the process begins again. Curian says they are identifying one to three contacts per case, but adds they haven't seen a sustained transmission from those contacts to anyone else. Dr. Curian believes the current emergency orders have proven to be beneficial, but she warns if others aren't following social distancing guidelines, things could quickly change. While a mask is a must, social distancing should also be used to keep the virus from spreading. When folks um, tend to relax a little bit, we tend to have a second peak. So stay home um, if you're sick. Stay home from other folks. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. I want to take a quick look now at the cases of COVID-19 in our surrounding counties. Several counties reporting a rise tonight. Hayes County seeing 117 cases. Wilson County has 19 cases. Comal remains at 43 cases. Guadalupe is reporting 53 cases. Atascosa with nine, Medina County has 15, Kendall 14, Bandera County now has four cases with one reported at a nursing home there. Meanwhile, the Frank M. Tejeda Veterans Nursing Home in Floresville now has eight positive COVID-19 cases. Oh, we've seen the long lines for food amid this pandemic. The San Antonio Food Bank holding mega distributions of food with thousands responding. Tomorrow, another massive giveaway will happen at the Alamo Dome, but the spots available have already been filled. As Courtney Friedman reports, the food bank is shifting the way these events happen, as well as the different ways to get food to people. You know, this is our, our, our fifth mega food distribution. Michael Guerra is the chief resource officer for the San Antonio Food Bank. He says the first three mega sites served about 2,000 families each. Last week's number swelled as we entered the Passover and Easter weekend. Um, the feeding of the 5,000, we were kind of inspired to go big. Um, 5,000 turned into 6,000 and we capped it and it, obviously everybody knows we ended up with 10,000. Tomorrow's distribution and others in the future will be scaled down. 2,000 households will be the focus for these kinds of distributions, and pre-registration will be required. So our, our mega distribution tomorrow is at the Alamo Dome. Pre-registration is required and it's full. Uh, nothing we hate more than somebody be turned away, but we, we can, we're only taking so much food, and so we know that um, if, if more come, that we won't be able to serve them all. But there are other avenues to consider if you're in need, like the food bank's network of pantries. The hotline to call is 210-431-8326. Food pantry network, the 500 plus food pantries in San Antonio, that's our first line of defense. I mean, we want people to call our helpline to find out where can they get a food pantry near them. For those who are homebound, the food bank recently started working with VIA. Hundreds of food packages have already been delivered. And then the week after that, we're going to start home deliveries with volunteers as well. We're just getting so many calls of folks who can't come to a pantry or a distribution right now and are asking for a home delivery of grocery products. The food bank constantly adapting as we make our way through this pandemic. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And speaking of the food bank, tomorrow we have set up a live interview with the president and CEO of the San Antonio Food Bank, Eric Cooper. It's part of our coronavirus Q&A San Antonio questions. So send in your questions online at ksat.com. Just click on the SAQ San Antonio questions section. Well, the San Antonio City Council is considering the creation of a $15.8 million COVID-19 emergency housing assistance program. The money would come from the San Antonio Housing Trust, the affordable housing budget, and some federal funds. It'll help residents with expenses like rent, mortgages, and utilities. The city would also expand the program to help pay for gas, groceries, and even internet expenses. We think it's about 10000 and that assumes that they would each get on average about $1,500 in assistance through either rent or mortgage assistance. 
Recipients would need to show proof of a hardship like job loss or a medical emergency. The program would end after July. The council will vote on the new program next week. Well, still ahead on the night beat, a chore turned into an entertaining task for one local neighborhood, and it was all caught on camera. I love that story. And can you get COVID-19 if you have the flu? Your San Antonio questions coming up. At the airport, making adjustments to keep up with projects amid the pandemic. We'll show you how coming up next on the night beat. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Before the pandemic, the San Antonio International Airport taking in about 10.3 million passengers a year. During this time of year, they would typically see about 16,000 passengers a day. Now, an average of only 700 passengers are using the airport on a daily basis. So how does the airport stay open and cover operating costs? Well, they have to get creative, changing job titles, cutting some projects, putting others on hold. But as Courtney Friedman explains, some projects are still pushing forward. Some basic changes to reduce airport expenditures, closing some bathrooms and roping off some seating that won't have to be cleaned every day with high grade products and keeping as much staff as possible by moving them around. Redeploying some some staff that typically don't do janitorial type cleaning. Airport Chief Administration Officer Mookie Patel says there are five non-mandatory maintenance projects being canceled. Then there are about 20 projects, $16 million worth, that will eventually happen but are on hold, including two gate projects and badge and ID office expansions. But Patel says some airport projects must continue. One being airfield projects, uh, taxiways, uh, taxiway runway improvement projects. Those are federally funded. So really of a 100% project, 75% comes from the federal government. There's safety and security related projects like a perimeter front fence project. One project that will continue in a more segmented way is the airport's largest, the strategic development or master plan, an airport transformation meant to last 20 to 30 years. There are three phases, land side, things like roadways and parking, terminal, which includes gate restrooms and restaurants, and then the airfield. All will be slowed down eventually by the community input component mandated by the FAA, almost all of which has been done in person. Could you maybe just pivot to only online? We could. We're going to take the pulse of our council and direction from our city leaders of what representation they, what, what their representatives feel that needs to happen. The airfield will slow the most since it's the furthest along and ready for input. There needs to be outreach related to um, how the airfield will operate, which runways, where they will go in the future, and how aircraft will operate on those facilities. Other phases need more work before community input, but will continue at a slower pace. For terminal, they're still studying passenger numbers. And for land side, they're still calculating use of roadways, parking, and curbside needs. But it's tough to count increases in passengers or rideshare users when the airport is basically empty. The master plan won't necessarily need to be rewritten. Um, we'll just follow a different trajectory for a period of time. A lot's up in the air, but Patel believes the airport will bounce back after the pandemic. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And Patel says a lot of the progress also depends on federal, state, and local funding over the next four or five years. Just this week, the airport received $39.7 million as part of the Federal CARES Act. That money will be used for debt payments to keep the facility running, paying utilities and payroll, as well as part of that master plan. The federal government was already paying for 75% of the master plan. Now the CARES grant is covering the rest. Well, just a reminder, starting Monday, we will be rebroadcasting all of the 2019 Fiesta parades, starting with the Texas Cavaliers River Parade. It's our way of keeping the Fiesta spirit alive. And here's a look at the full schedule here. You can also find it online on ksat.com. And while you're there, don't forget to upload your favorite Fiesta pics. All right, check this out. One local family turning a mundane task into a piece of entertainment as we deal with the social distancing guidelines. This is in Shirts, city not too far, far away. PJ sent us this video of her son Brandon and her husband Eric dressed up as Star Wars Shadow Troopers taking out the trash. 
That's some heavily guarded That's trash. Cool, yeah. yeah, they were even wearing masks. PJ says neighbors loved it. Cars were stopping to show support. A nice little break from all the coronavirus coverage. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam. Oh, it's just beautiful outside. A very comfortable 70 degrees right now. And when we lost, last saw Adam Kasky, he was shooting a confetti <laughs> cannon off in his own house. How's, <laughs> how's the cleanup go? Yeah, that's what yeah. I want to know. How was the cleanup? You know, it was it, it went well it went well we had all five of us uh, really going strong three three brooms a leaf blower and we got it all all done all, well most of it cleaned up of course it it, it goes everywhere <laughs> my daughter even dragged some in here so you know it just Stuff gets in every nook and cranny. It's like sand. All right, so we did celebrate Fiesta Fiesta at the Kasky household earlier today. That was fun. It was a big hit. I enjoyed myself as much as the kids had a good time. All right, so let's talk about our weather headlines here. We're going to see some changes coming down the pike over the next couple of days. Becoming humid tonight, southeasterly wind increasing the humidity. That's going to lead to some low clouds. A few gray and damp days are ahead of us. And also, get ready for a big temperature swing. We're going to see a big change in temperatures here over the really ne just next couple of days. All right, temperatures right now right around 70 degrees, upper 60s for many locations. Some spots still in the low 70s, such as Castroville right now at 72 degrees. But for the most part, we're right around 70 and an even 70 degrees here in San Antonio at the airport. And you look off to the west closer to the border and well, we're in the lower 70s, so a few degrees warmer farther west of San Antonio. Look what temperatures do in the days ahead. I mean, we go from 76 for the high today to 74 tomorrow down to 62 on Saturday, and then Sunday we turn it around and jump up to nearly 90 degrees for the high temperature. Yes, big time changes coming our way. And I have some very good news to report here with the drought monitor. The newest one is in. This is the drought monitor from three weeks ago, and it indicates a wide area of severe to ext extreme drought in South Texas, the red indicating the extreme drought. Okay, now let's skip forward to the most recent drought monitor, which just came in today. Ta-da! Much better situation for us. Actually, most of Bear County is not even considered in drought right now, just abnormally dry. And even part of the coastal plain, we've got that nice little donut hole there in the middle that indicates no drought and not even abnormally dry conditions. So we've made up a lot of ground lately, but of course we would still like to see more rainfall. We'd like to chip away at all of this drought. And although we'll see, I think, some showers the next couple of days, don't get your hopes up for really a lot of accumulation out there. Here's our weather pattern. Clouds have been increasing from the southwest. Here's our next cold front that's going to be moving into town. It's definitely a cold, cold front. Look at the snow on the back side of that, indicated by the blue radar signatures there. So this is going to drop our way. And as our future cast shows, it's basically going to keep us cloudy and a little damp with a few spotty light showers. Like I said, don't get your hopes up for real good accumulations, just overall dampness and kind of dreary conditions the next couple of days with the hit or miss light showers and sprinkles tomorrow. We get into Saturday and I think we'll have a very similar situation as well, but it will be noticeably cooler. So here's a look at the forecast tomorrow. We'll wake up to a temperature in the 60s. It's, or it's not going to be all that cold in the morning, not like the past couple of mornings, 62 degrees in the morning. Then we'll hit our high temperature in the early afternoon into the 70s. The cold front hits and temperatures plummet then tomorrow evening, and that's going to set the stage for the much cooler Saturday. I mean, we're looking at the readings in the lower 60s with a few spotty off and on light showers, not much for accumulation. That'll last through Saturday night and we get into Sunday and we see the big changes where we see the temperatures spike again with a lot of sunshine and right near 90 degrees. So talk about big changes out there just between Saturday and Sunday and next week, sunny and well into the 80s. Yeah, All that right, variation. that's the latest. Of, let's see if I can get a it's just little more confetti for you. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be finding it in your house for like the until. Good luck with that, Adam. Yes, mm -hmm. it really happens in November. So. All right. Thank you, Adam. We got some breaking news. We want to bring you with Sky 12 right now on the city's west side.
Yeah, this is happening at Acme and Old Highway 90. Uh, as you can see, a uh, large police presence on the scene. We can tell you that scanner traffic initially reported this out as um, the end of a police chase. However, we don't have anything confirmed right now. Um, obviously, a lot of activity there at Acme and Old Highway 90. Again, on the city's west side, we do have a crew on the way to try and confirm some of those details and get more information for us. If my recollection is correct, he was a Super Bowl MVP. You're correct, and it's very rare that NFL active players reported any uh, reports about being infected by the coronavirus. That is not the case now. This is his second, and this one hits home because he's a former Aggie. When we come back, more about what Von Miller has to say about the coronavirus infecting him, and Bill O'Brien defends his controversial trade coming up. Yesterday, David passed his physical uh, with flying colors, uh, and he, he's ready to go. He's excited, and, and uh, you know we just we're just excited to the to the for the day that we can get back out there. And with that, the most controversial trade in the history of the Houston Texas is now official. More on that in just a moment in Big Board Sports. But first, pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Former Aggie number one draft pick Von Miller is tested positive for the coronavirus, as according to his agent Joby. Branion. Branion says the Super Bowl 50 MVP is resting at his home and is in good spirits. He says the Denver Broncos star will speak publicly about it tomorrow. Miller is the second active NFL player to test positive for the coronavirus after Los Angeles Rams center Brian Allen announced on Wednesday he had also tested positive for the virus. For the first time since he pulled the trigger on the most controversial trade in the history of the Houston Texans, head coach and now team general manager Bill O'Brien is talking in a press conference held on Zoom today. O'Brien defended his trade of the NFL's arguably number one wide receiver to the Arizona the Cardinals running back David Johnson that did not include a number one draft pick, blaming Hopkins future contract demands for three years still left on his current deal, pointing out that Texas still had to pay J.J. Watt and deal with new contracts for both the quarterback Deshaun Watson and offensive lineman Laramie Tunsil. It was in the best interest of our team to to move DeAndre to Arizona. Uh, we feel like we made a really good deal with Arizona. We're so excited about having David Johnson on board here. We've got the 40th pick next week in the draft um we're really excited about that um and we wish deandre the best uh deandre is a great football player and he'll do well in arizona we wish him the best in arizona but texans fans are upset because o'brien had decided to take johns with only a second round draft pick and pick up the remaining two years on a more than 20 million dollars remaining on johnson's contract whose best year was behind him finishing over 1,200 yards rushing and 16 touchdowns in 2016. Johnson finished just over 1,300 yards from 2017 to 2019. O'Brien is pleading patience. We feel really good about when we looked at the analytics of it based on the production uh, that, we, that was leaving our, our team and the production that we were bringing in and then what we were able to do. Again, it's very incomplete. I would say let's, let's review it you know, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. Let's let it all play out. All right. There's speculation the Dallas Cowboys are targeted defensive back or defensive end in the upcoming NFL draft. As after they lost both Byron Jones to Miami, Robert Quinn to Chicago in free agency, mid reports that Randy Gregory and Alvin Smith would not be reinstated before the draft. Among the possibilities, according to USA Today, Florida cornerback C.J. Henderson or LSU edge rusher Clavon Chasen. First start of Marcus Audrey says he would be fine with finishing his career in San Antonio or in Portland. That's after his former Blazers teammate Damian Lillard created quite a stir when he said LaMarcus is the former teammate he would most like to see return. And to add fuel to the fire, Aldridge, who signed with the Spurs in 2015 as a free agent after spending his first nine seasons in Portland, responded with that tweet with an open eye emoji to the tweet that has since been deleted. The reason Aldridge is still under contract with the Spurs in the social media post could be considered tampering. In a conversation with NBA.com, Aldridge admitted to posting the emoji, saying he was bored. Remember, Aldridge and the rest of the Spurs have not played a single game since they beat the Dallas Mavericks back on March the 10th, 119-109, and now Mr a total of 19 games in the 2019-2020 season that came to a so-called end last night. But in the follow-up interview, Aldridge told NBA.com that he would be fine with finishing his career in the Alamo City or Portland. Aldridge, who's under contract with the Silver and Black through next season for an additional $24 million, had this to say in the interview. And he said, in part, I would be cool with 
ending in two places, either with San Antonio or in Portland. I think either one would be fine with me. I feel like I made some good memories in San Antonio. I feel like I'm really a good in a really good family in San Antonio. They understand me, understand them. So I like that. UTSA baseball is in the midst of a good season with a new head coach until the coronavirus hits. Next. UTSA baseball team started their first season under head coach Pat Hallmark in prematurely thanks to the coronavirus. Prior to the shutdown, the Roadrunners are 10 and 7 overall, won the annual Iris Alamo Classic at Wolf Stadium with a decent chunk of this year's seniors coming back next season. Hallmark and his staff have combined with UTSA strength and conditioning coaches to keep his players in shape with home workouts. Someone on my staff, whether it's me or Coach Aguayo or uh, Coach Shepard, we, we talk to every player every day, um, one of us. And most of the most of the guys seem to be knocking out those those lifting programs and, and conditioning programs, and I think they kind of want to. It adds just a tiny bit of normalcy to their day, which has been obviously very abnormal now for a month or so. So they are staying active, and and they're not pressing as much weight as they used to, but they're doing something to keep their bodies going, which is great. And that's not just UTSA baseball. That's now the new normal for all athletes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. They are on the front lines of this pandemic, often described as the heroes in this crisis. We speak with an emergency room doctor in tonight's edition of San Antonio Questions Coronavirus Q&A coming up. The death toll in the United States now more than 31,000. Still many states are starting to see the number of new cases level off or decrease as plans move forward to start reopening businesses. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez has the latest. Before President Trump's announcement sharing plans to reopen the country. We are not opening all at once but one careful step at a time. Several state and city leaders concerned about acting too soon, moving to extend their shutdowns until at least mid-May, including in New York, where the still staggering number of deaths from COVID-19 is slowly declining, along with the hospitalization rate. Healthcare workers on the front lines, including ER Dr. Melanie Malloy, showing us the challenges they're still facing in places like Mount Sinai Hospital in Brooklyn. Most of our beds are taken up by intubated patients, meaning patients who can't breathe on their own and who are on the ventilator. The virus still having a devastating impact on nursing homes in this country. At this senior facility in New Jersey, the bodies of 15 residents found in a small morgue meant to hold just four. They were overcome by bodies and we needed to be able to help them. And in South Dakota, the largest coronavirus outbreak in the country, nearly 600 people testing positive at this pork processing plant. Those workers then infecting more than 100 others. But some signs of progress in this country's battle against this pandemic. A team in Salt Lake City tracking the contacts of 85% of people infected there, a key in preventing further spread. What date did you start to feel like you had some kind of symptoms? And moments of hope like this one in Southern California. After two weeks in intensive care battling COVID-19, 75-year-old Jim Mastrobuono now heading home. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. Separating the facts from fiction surrounding this pandemic, we're continuing this new portion of the show where we bring viewer questions about COVID-19 to the experts. Tonight, we're once again speaking with Dr. Robert A. Frolickstein, an emergency room doctor working right here in San Antonio. Doctor, thank you for joining us on this Thursday, as you always do. And what I, the question I always start out with is, what are you seeing in the emergency room right now? So we are we are seeing some some cases, not a dramatic increase in, in the number of new cases we're seeing, which is great news. Um, and what's also great news is we're starting to see some discharges, some patients recovering and getting discharged from the hospital. So our overall number of cases hospitalized is remaining pretty pretty constant. That's great news. There's been some incredible work done by our uh, ICU teams and just amazing amazing work that they're doing to get people through this virus. You're seeing some success stories. Yes, indeed. When we talked a week ago, you were also concerned that maybe people who you would normally see in the emergency room might not be coming in. Is that still your concern? 
I, I, I'm still concerned about that. Um, we're, our volumes are still about half as many patients as we normally see. Uh, so we just still urge you, please come in. We have processes. Everyone is screened immediately upon arrival, of whether we're suspicious they may have COVID or not. Those that we have no suspicion are segregated. They're put in a separate area of the emergency department than those that, that may have COVID. And that's even if you have an ankle fracture you, and you come in. If you have cough, cold, and we we're worried about you having COVID, you're going to be separated over here. So we're doing everything we can to keep uh, everyone that comes to the patient to, to the emergency department safe, as well as our staff safe. All right. Next viewer question: When you see our local numbers, what is your reaction? Are we on the right track in this flattening the curve that we've heard so much about? I think so. I, I think that's the only uh, conclusion that that can be drawn. And you know, the, the flattening of the curve uh, certainly decreases the you know the amount of cases we see at one time, and it also pushes the peak away. And we keep seeing our projected peak being pushed down the road, which is good because the overall numbers are then much much less. So I, I'm very encouraged with the very small growth in the number of new cases we're seeing here. Mayor Ron Nuremberg and the county judge made an announcement today the city and county now requiring people over the age of 10 that they wear face coverings when in public. Is this the right move in your opinion? I think so. And again, I think it's a it's an extension of the social distancing that social distancing or I've actually heard this term uh, physical distancing which I like a lot better because uh, uh, we should be talking to each other and communicating. But anyway, I digress. So, uh, physical <laughs> distancing helps flatten this curve, and that's and we're seeing the success of that. Wearing face masks is simply an extension of that. Yeah. It's really hard to be physically distant from people at the grocery store or those types of places. That's why I think the masks are a great idea. If I test positive for the flu, is it possible I also? have COVID-19? It, it's certainly possible. We don't know how um, frequent that may be. There are some case uh, reports out of, I think it was Stanford, where as many as 20% of the COVID positive patients also tested for un positive for another viral illness, like the flu or any of the other viral illnesses that are out there. So it's certainly possible. Uh, this next one says, hi, we are staying home with our families and pets. Is there a danger in getting too close to our pets and letting, letting them lick our face? Well, assuming your pets are also house pets and they're not having frequent contact with other animals, I would say the chances are zero. Um, I, there has been, I guess, a, a case of a few animals. I think there was a tiger that tested positive. But I, I think the odds are just overwhelmingly low that your pet is going to give you COVID. So uh, there's a lot of things to worry about. I don't think that should be one of the things we ought to be worrying about. We talked about patient safety off the top of this segment. And the next question is a personal one for you. How worried are you about personal safety when you go to work? Well, it's a it's a it's a unique time, and it's uh, I, I've never been fearful going to work, and, and I wouldn't say I'm fearful now, um, but I'm extra cautious. Um, and th you know, I have the protective equipment available, and I think taking reasonable precautions that we do is going to protect us. Um, but it's it's an unknown, and and unknowns are always scary things. I'd like to give you the last word, so you, you take the floor, and what do you want our viewers to know tonight? Well, thanks, Steve. You know, we hear, um, and we're so appreciative of all the things the community is doing for, uh, for the nurses and physicians, the people working at the hospital. That is outstanding, and I've, and I've heard reference to us as being heroes, and, and, and we, well, we really appreciate that sentiment. Uh, you know, we've signed up for this job, and so we're we're supposed to, we are doing what we're supposed to be doing. I think the real heroes are you all at home, um, because you are making the big sacrifice by by not going out, not congregating, and that is what's making a difference. So I thank you for that, and I urge you to continue with that practice. Dr. Robert Frolickstein, local emergency room doctor. I as always, I appreciate it, and thank you, doctor. 
Thank you, Steve. We'll be right back. I want to get back to that breaking news from the city's west side. Bear County deputies telling us they tried pulling over a couple driving erratically after leaving an apartment. This is near old Highway 90 and Acme. Investigators are still there on the scene, but if you look closely, you can see a vehicle that appears to have gone through a fence in this uh, pic live picture from the scene. Yeah, and at one point, deputies say the woman was driving but switched seats with her boyfriend before crashing on Westridge and La uh, Laverne, excuse me, that's again near Old Highway 90 and Acme. We're told both then tried to run but were caught. Deputies say the man did have warrants out for his arrest. Well, prelimi preliminary study showing some positive results when it comes to so-called power plasma. That's the word from a doctor working with plasma donated by recovered COVID-19 patients. We've been following the process of the experimental treatment for weeks. The treatment was first used in China, but is now being used in San Antonio. Their fevers resolved quicker, their x-ray findings improved, um, overall they felt better. And in some of these studies, they thought there was a, a signal um, towards improved survival. Now, there is still a need for donors, and more than 170 patients have recovered from COVID-19 here in Bear County. If you want to donate, contact the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center by email at COVID-19 at SouthTexasBlood.org or call 210-731-2719. Speaking of that power plasma, we're following one man's road to recovery. We first spoke to Jimmy Hayden's wife on Monday, days after he received the power plasma treatment. Our Devin Clark checks in with his family and tells us about how they're seeing a light at the end of the, end of the recovery tunnel. Um, we've had great news. After weeks of uncertainty, Ashley Hayden is now able to breathe a sigh of relief. My husband was able to be removed from the ventilator yesterday, and he's doing great today. Her husband, 47-year-old Jimmy Hayden, who was diagnosed with COVID-19, spent weeks fighting for his life. It was horrible. It was, you know, it's, you never want to see your spouse or anyone you love in that condition. Ashley believes her husband's turnaround is thanks to an experimental treatment. He received plasma with COVID-19 antibodies from a former patient. Shortly after, he began to improve and is expected to be moved from the intensive care unit in a couple of days. And then they will move him to another area um, where he'll get some physical therapy to help him, you know, walk again and everything get him back to normal so he can come home. Ashley now hoping her family's story can inspire other former patients to help if they can. We need all the donors we can get. So yes, please donate. We have more. Again, more information on KSAT.com. That was Devin Clark reporting. Yeah, I love that story. Mm -hmm. Recovery. Remarkable. Absolutely. All right, let's check in with Adam Kasky. Somebody on Twitter called it the best live event on television <laughs> in a long time. The Kasky crew getting <laughs> showered after, by confetti. After that live shot, I text Adam the same thing. <laughs> Well, I, I, I really appreciate that. I don't know if it was, was I don't know if it was television history, but it oh, come great. on, it was hold a on, great, we're coming back great, up. Here we go. It was a great moment. Stay with me. Stay with me here. Yes, it was a lot of fun. And um, I, I'm thinking we're just going to have to have more Fiesta shenanigans from the Caskey household as we get into next week as well. I mean, Monday would be the River Parade, and then we'd have many more events, including Flambeau. Let's get creative. Maybe have more confetti. You can never have too much confetti. Oh, we had a good time. Took a village to clean it up, though. All right, 76. That was our high temperature today after we started off at 47. So a big temperature range throughout the day today. Temperatures aren't going to see as big of a swing throughout the day tomorrow. But there will be a big difference as we get into Saturday and the weekend. Right now we're right around 70 degrees, exactly 70 in San Antonio, Catula at 73 in Fredericksburg right now at 66. Now you look farther to the north of us and that's where you really see some cooler temperatures. There's a cold front that's headed our way and that cold front is already in the panhandle of Texas. And look at these temperatures, 71 in Lubbock. Then you get up into Guymon, Oklahoma, it's 37. North Platte, Nebraska at 31, Denver 23. 
This is a real deal cold front, folks, that's headed our way, and it's going to impact the first part of our weekend. Even some snow on the backside of this system, where you see the blue on the radar screen, that indicates the snow. That's all headed, I shouldn't say that's all headed our way, but some moisture is headed our way. In our future cast shows, that we'll have the low clouds tomorrow, some off and on areas of very light rain, sprinkles, maybe some passing drizzle, just overall kind of damp and dreary for two days as this cold front works its way through town and we see a bit of a transition. Just don't be too hopeful in terms of actual rainfall accumulations. I think they'll be pretty slim and on the low end here uh, with this cold front and behind it. So humid tomorrow morning. We'll have a few sprinkles out there as well. And then during the day, just some hit or miss, highly isolated little light showers. We'll go from 62 at sunrise to 67 in the afternoon, but between that time period, we'll have our high temperature around the noon hour of 74. So we will make it into the 70s briefly, then the cold front hits in the afternoon, and that causes everything to fall off tomorrow night and on into Saturday. Saturday, 62 for the high temperature. So we go from 70s yesterday and today, all the way down into the 60s tomorrow, uh, in, into Saturday, Saturday lower 60s, and then we rebound quite significantly on Sunday. We're back up near 90 degrees on Sunday with a good amount of sunshine. As for rain, yes, I do think we'll have a little bit here and there on Saturday, but I don't think it's going to be all that widespread, not a whole lot in terms of actual showers out there. And actually, most of Sunday is looking pretty sunny despite some early morning rain chances. And next week, warm, sunny, what we typically get into in April, well into the 80s. All right, if you have any other fiesta shenanigans, send them my way. You know we like to have fun in this house and you look at next it. week. <laughs> well, it's going to be quiet. <laughs> Gives you time to think about a devise a new uh, fiesta plan there. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. It's like a mad scientist yeah. with shenanigans. <laughs> Still ahead, we're going to show you ways to transform your not ideal remote workstation into something more comfortable while at home. Plus, how a local business is changing their product to help out its employees and first responders. It's coming up. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Maverick Distillery on Broadway is now bottling a different brand of alcohol hand sanitizer. The owners say it's a little difficult to get the supplies and ingredients they need, but even so, Maverick Distillery's employees are trying to keep up with the demand. Much of the hand sanitizer is being donated to first responders and others. Obviously there's a need and people are so very thankful to have the hand sanitizer. Thank you. And the public has been immensely grateful uh, for the opportunity to be able to buy it as well. The video about the distillery and its historic background is part of the IMG Studio hashtags support local. It's a campaign urging residents to shop local and help employees keep their jobs. Is your dining room, kitchen island, or even your couch suddenly your office? Well, millions of people are now working or going to school from home, often trying to get the job done in less than ideal conditions. 12 Near Sides' Marilyn Moritz has some simple ways to minimize the aches and pains while maximizing productivity. If this is you hunched over squinting at your screen, you might be experiencing muscle strains, headaches, and even dry eyes. Even if you don't have a fully equipped home office, you can still create a healthy workstation and for cheap just by using stuff around the house. Start with your chair. Ergonomics experts say you want your feet to rest on the floor and your lower back to fit snugly against the back of the chair. If your back doesn't reach, put a pillow behind you. And if your feet don't reach, create a foot rest. Your eye should be your arm's length away from the computer and the top of the monitor should be at eye level so you're gazing slightly down toward the center of the screen. Next, bend your arms anywhere from 90 degrees to 115 degrees when you place them on your keyboard. Now that you're comfortably seated, it's important to take breaks. When you're staring at the computer screen for really long stretches, we tend to avoid blinking. That may lead to eye strain and painful dry eye. So follow the 20-20-20 rule. Every 20 minutes, take a 20-second break and look away 20 feet. Finally, keep moving throughout the day. 
Taking short breaks to walk or stretch can help alleviate that neck and back pain you get sitting at a desk all day. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Well, get the rice ready. You're invited to this impromptu wedding ceremony. Next. No matter the hour, we are always online at ksat.com. Our web team is keeping track of the coronavirus pandemic with the latest numbers and the many efforts underway to help our community through this trying time. We have an entire page dedicated to this effort. It's all online at ksat.com. Well, a pair of Duke University hospital physicians exchanging their vows at an impromptu ceremony after their wedding was postponed due to the coronavirus. The couple recited their nuptials in front of co-workers at the Duke Birthing Center. Friends and family watched virtually. The happy couple who are from New York say an official wedding is upcoming. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Some non-coronavirus news to leave you with. Why did the ducks cross the road? The Manatee County Sheriff's Office posting a video online of a mother duck and her 20 ducklings crossing a road to get some water. The department says it's a reminder to always follow the speed limit. No word on if they were actually violating those stay at home orders. So cute, though. Look at the so line of cute. them. Yeah, police escort. <laughs> That's it for the night beat. Don't forget, good morning, San Antonio at 430. Good night.